Hello, I'm Susan Ray. Jorge Cavalli and I had the pleasure of organising a symposium for IUPS in Birmingham, July 2013. Our symposium was entitled My Mutual Physiology, Time to Translate. We were delighted that Experimental Physiology chose our symposium to sponsor and that the presentations from the symposium are appearing in Experimental Physiology in March 2014. Our aims for the symposium were to bring together scientists at the forefront of their research areas to share both their latest findings but also their views on how near or far their research areas are to being clinically applicable. The need for new clinical treatments and drugs can be readily appreciated when the toll from preterm slow to progress labours and postpartum haemorrhage are considered. Around 30 million births worldwide occur prematurely, putting the babies at risk of severe mental or physical handicap or even death. Labours that start at the right time can also run into difficulties. Around 1 in 10 first-time mothers have contractions that become too weak or uncoordinated to dilate the cervix and deliver the baby. This results in maternal exhaustion, problems for the foetus, and often the need for an emergency caesarean section as the only way of saving the baby. And even if delivery of the baby and placenta has gone well, there still remains the risk of postpartum haemorrhage, which is an obstetric emergency of serious consequence because a large part of the maternal cardiac output has been going to the placenta and this has to be stemmed. All these three conditions, that is, preterm labour, slow to progress labour and postpartum haemorrhage, can be related to the activity and the control of the smooth muscle of the uterus, the myometrium. Why does it start to contract too early? Why does it fatigue? Why does it sometimes not perform the tonic contraction needed to prevent haemorrhage by clamping on the uterine blood vessels after delivery of the placenta? It is clear that we have to better understand the physiology of the myometrium and work to translate this knowledge. So how close are we? What are the current limitations to our understanding of myometrial physiology? What ways forward should we suggest? And what new approaches to the study of this tissue are needed? To accomplish answering these questions, or at least addressing them, we solicited contributions from experts in modelling, cutting-edge molecular techniques, and looking for new drugs in medicinal plants. As well as the boundaries of our knowledge, it's worth reflecting on what other impediments there may be to both obtaining myometrial physiological and pathophysiological data, and then to translating and applying this. We would point to the need to increase critical mass at the basic science end of the pipeline from discovery to patient benefit. This, of course, is linked to funding opportunities which are unfortunately far too limited for this sort of research, despite the clear need for better therapies. We hope, therefore, that this collection of articles may stimulate interest in and pressure for further initiatives specific to the myometrium. I had the pleasure of starting the symposium off with an overview of our understanding both the basic physiology of the myometrium, particularly excitation contraction coupling, but also uterine function in different patient groups. Already from our understanding of the mechanisms of excitation contraction coupling, drugs targeted at this pathway, such as nifedipine, a calcium channel blocker, have been applied to prevent premature uterine contractions. Taking this work further, I described our recent data on lactate as an example of translational research, as lactate can be used as a marker for dysfunctional, that is slow to progress, 
labours. We showed lactate levels were elevated in women suffering these labours and it has now been shown that lactate is present at higher amounts in the amniotic fluid of these women giving a biomarker for the slow to progress labours and leading also to the more rewarding thought of by understanding the mechanisms better we can prevent them and therefore hopefully prevent at source these slow to progress labours. Our article then highlights examples of where physiological research has started to provide mechanistic insight into clinical problems associated with labour and parturition, including obese women, diabetics, women of advanced maternal age, post-state pregnancies and twin pregnancies. And we've suggested how these findings could be translated into new therapies for difficult labours, although they are further from translation than the work on lactate. It's clear from what has been said earlier that more armoury is required to help prevent preterm delivery in those cases where it's beneficial for the foetus to remain in utero. One approach is therefore to investigate those mechanisms that maintain myometrial quiescence. And it's this subject that is reviewed by Jorge in this symposium collection. He presents the evidence that a premature decrease of fetal membrane-derived inhibitory factors may cause preterm labour. Furthermore, he shares novel data highlighting the role of locally produced brain natriuretic peptide as a key component of these inhibitory factors. As he points out, this peptide is more potent than any other natriuretic peptide at inhibiting myometrial contractions. And it's going to be interesting to see how this work develops in the next year or two. Greenwood and Tribe, in their article, consider iron channels and their role in the transition from quiescence to active labour. Their recent work has led them to focus upon potassium channels encoded by the KCNQ genes and ether agogo related genes, so-called ERGs. They note how voltage-gated potassium channels encoded by KCNQ and ERGs, termed KV7, and KV11, respectively, are accepted as major determinants of neuronal and cardiac excitability and show that there is now growing evidence for their functional role in smooth muscle, and specifically that KV7 channels may be a potential therapeutic target for the treatment of preterm labour. The group is progressing this with the hope of getting a therapeutic target in the near future. Indeed, a very exciting prospect. From work presented by Dr Andrew Blanks, his group have published an associated paper entitled Assessment of Myometrial Transcriptome Changes Associated with Spontaneous Human Labour by High-Throughput RNA-Sec. As they note, the biological timescale of the transition from quiescence to labouring means that the cellular phenotype is modified by changes in the transcriptome, which in turn is under the control of the underlying endocrine, paracrine and biophysical processes resulting from the ongoing pregnancy. By studying differentially expressed genes, novel hypotheses germane to the initiation of labour should be generated. And it was much appreciated how this cutting-edge science of RNA-Sec is being applied to the myometrium and we look forward to the testing of some of these hypotheses that are going to be generated. In her article, Dr Kathleen Morgan steps outside the intracellular environment to consider the cytoskeleton and extracellular inputs into the control of uterine contractility. Her paper develops the argument that in late pregnancy, circ-mediated vocal adhesion signalling appears to provide a regulated, 
attention sensor and force transmitter in the myometrial cell. This leads us to suggest that there is mounting evidence that focal adhesion proteins and their interactions with the cytoskeleton may present a new mode of regulation of uterine contractility. And we enjoyed hearing Kathleen taking us through this journey from outside to inside and back again. Finally, researchers in Thailand, led by Dr. Sajira Kapitayanant, showed the wealth of new drugs that could be available from medicinal plants, with a fine mechanistic dissection of the pathways in excitation contraction coupling that are targeted. They illustrated potent effects on myometrium from these plant extracts. They overview their data from studies of ginger, watermelon, pomegranate and wild ginger, which indeed sounds a very attractive mixture. Their stimulation article opens our eyes to what may be the next generation of drugs to translate to better control myometrial contractility. They have found extracts that excite the myometrium and extracts that help keep it quiescent. And interestingly, these extracts target different pathways in the myometrium. So again, much food for thought there. We really hope you enjoy reading this collection of papers in experimental physiology and that myometrial research moves ever more rapidly into translation. <laughs>